Welcome to People Love Process. The creative industry has trends like any other industry, and in this movie, we're going to address a current creative trend and develop and build our own idea aligning with the popular aesthetic. This is going to be a fun one, so let's jump right into it. And we're going to start with Mickey Mouse, because at the foundation of this specific trend is characteristics that have been derived from Mickey Mouse from day one. Now, Mickey was first copyrighted as a character in 1928. This is a 1930 United States Patent Office filing of Mickey Mouse for a toy, I believe it was, but his copyright was secured in 1923. It should have ran its course and gone into public domain uh, by the mid to late 50s, but Disney has a lot of money and a lot of influence, and Mickey Mouse is still copyright protected. Now, I can show them like this because I'm not utilizing it. This is for sake of education, and that's within fair rights use of the Copyright Act. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the modern aesthetic that is being done right now in terms of character illustration are a lot of characters. And you'll see and notice that they use a lot of derived um, kind of metaphoric handling of the character's hands and feet, and it goes all the way back to Mickey Mouse. So I thought it was important to point that out. Now, the style I'm talking about specifically is this character style, and it's basically these anthropomorphized characters that take everyday objects, whether it's a, a compass up here, whether it's a, you know, one of your God, I can't even remember the name of it. The sand dripping, whatever, hourglass. There we go. <laughs> Couldn't remember what those things were called. I haven't seen one in years. And then you have uh, Mr. Cup, which is another kind of anthropomorphized uh, cup. And then you have a camera, you have a globe, the peace sign, you have a star, you have another coffee cup, you have a burger, you have a, a fishing bobber, and you have a piece of fruit. I believe that's a pear. And uh, even, even brand characters are really well known, such as Sonic, kind of play off some of that aesthetic where it utilizes those cartoon gloved kind of hands. And you can see those represented uh, in some of these other ones um, shown on this page. So this is the specific trend that I've been kind of watching for the last year and a half, and I thought it's fun. There's a couple specific artists I follow that I think do a good job in coming up with their, their concepts and metaphors playing off of this style. And that's what we want to approach is our own character design. And the metaphor I chose for myself is one based off of a sci-fi flick I always liked. And that is uh, The Matrix. And from The Matrix, you know, you have the main character, Neo, and he's kind of being woken up out of his stupor of, you know, being deceived from what true reality is. And then he's faced with the choice. Are you going to take the red pill which will fully reveal the true reality, or are you going to take the blue pill? And the blue pill is just being comfortably numb with how you want to live right now, and you don't have to worry about anything. Well, of course, we know how the story goes. He chooses the red pill, and everything else comes about it. Now, the newer movie, I really hate the newer movie. I like the original three movies. So uh, this is the metaphor we're playing off of, the red pill of sorts. And so this is where I start when it comes to drawing, just simple thumbnail drawing. I originally started drawing out a capsule. Uh, I mean, I've heard it called a capsule. It's called a pill, whatever. Um, but I didn't like this because I thought it overcomplicated the metaphor I'm trying to represent. Because uh, in a capsule, you can have all these little balls of medicine that are through the sea, through part of the capsule. And I, I didn't want to overcomplicate this. I wanted this to be very pared down and simple. So I chose a, more of a, a pill that you might see if you're taking aspirin of sorts. But that same idea of the glove hands and then those shoes. I don't even know what they call those kind of shoes. Uh, but they, they have heels. And this is where I started. Now, I don't 
build off of this level of sketch. I really try to figure out my shapes as I'm uh, before I even move to digital, move to Illustrator in this case, to build out my vector art. So I'm going to redraw this again in a rough form, but tighten the composition, really figure out the movement and how it's going to be uh, shaped. Now, all the arms and legs in these characters are kind of pipe cleaner type arms and legs. Uh, these will be the easiest of everything in the vector art to build because they can just be strokes and you're going to see that. Uh, but I'll tighten it up even more. Now, some people might build from this level of drawing, but I wouldn't because it still leaves too much guesswork, in my opinion. If you look at this hand, okay, how exactly is that shape of the thumb going to be formed? Well, I have a general idea, but not a more specific idea. And I want my drawing to serve as a roadmap for vector building. And this is where I'll go back to reference and I'll look at a pill and I see like detail on, on the front of the pill where it comes to the edge. It's not a perfectly flat surface. It has this little bump. So I want to reflect that in my drawing. That's why I drew that line. But once again, I'll take this and I'm just going to print it out at a larger size. So I print it out larger on 8.5 by 11. Uh, go ahead and print that out. And then I literally start drawing on top of it with vellum. You can see my sketch showing through uh, underneath, but I'm drawing it with more precision. I usually uh, use a mechanical pencil at this phase just so the line doesn't become too thick. And I just pay attention to how is this going to be shaped in vector form, and I draw it that way in analog form. Now, I learned drawing and design and illustration traditionally when I went to art school. Uh, that might give you a little idea of my <laughs> of my age. Uh, but my daughter works with me, and she does all of her sketching on the iPad, which is fine. Uh, whatever way you prefer to work, that's the way you want to do your drawing. Um, don't think you have to do it like me. I still do it old school. I use a light pad, a little thin light table type uh, set up and I like drawing on vellum. That's just my preference. Um, have I ever drawn on the iPad? Of course I have, but um, on a daily basis, it's usually analog I'm working in. And I drew this out in a more precise form so I know exactly how my shapes need to be formed as I move to Illustrator. Now, it's not that at this stage I don't art direct myself because I do. I drew this hand first, but by the time I got down to this hand, I'd drawn the feet and I realized this outline thickness looks a lot better than what I originally drew the hand at. So I went back, redrew the hand, fixed that thickness, and this is now going to be uh, the sketch that I'm going to use to build from. Now, what I like to do is I'm creating any type of project, whether it's logo concepts, whether it's character art like this or an illustration, um, I'll push it to a point I think I'm ready to go. And then I try to find time to set it aside. In this case, it was overnight and approach it the next day when I had some spare time. And when I did that, I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know what? I'm using these shoes because it's it's a common denominator between most of the art that I showed you, and it definitely harkens back to Mickey the Mouse, uh, but I'd never wear those shoes in my life. It's like, so I'd rather get a little more, uh, I don't know, a little more cooler looking with the shoes. So that's where I decided I need to change the shoes. So I grew up when... Uh, Chuck Taylors were really popular. I remember in sixth grade, we all wanted Chuck Taylors. And unfortunately, my parents were too cheap and went by me Chuck Taylors. I think they got me the equivalent in kids, K-E-D-S, which was a line of shoes. But they weren't as cool as Chuck Taylors. So I want to put this character in a pair of Chuck Taylors or style it similar to Chuck Taylors, I should say. And so that's when I'll go back and I'll start redrawing over the top of my original uh, uh, final drawing just to work out how I'm going to handle those shoes until I get what I think is going to work great. And it's at this point that I take my artwork and I scan it in. Now, I've noticed over the last... Uh, several years, the younger the audience is that watches my content, whether it's on LinkedIn Learning or uh, workshops I do uh, live, um, they usually ask me a question like, 
uh, excuse me, what do you mean by scan in? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like, okay, I'll, I'll go with it. Um, it's a flatbed scanner. It's, it's something that connects to your computer and you can place a, a large drawing. It could, you can get scanners up to 11 by 17 if you want to spend the money. Um, mine is just eight and a half by 14, which is the size I could scan in. But you can scan in at any resolution. I usually scan these in, uh, my original drawing in at like um, 800 PPI. And then I take it into Photoshop, adjust the contrast so I have a bitmap TIFF I can place into Illustrator. And that's what I've done here. So that's what I mean by scan in. Once I place it, I usually adjust the layer 15% and then I lock the layer. And this is going to become the roadmap that I'm going to build my vector art on. Now, when I start building vector shapes, the very first shapes I build or try to build at least are the ones that are the simplest shapes, the ones that I can create using shape tools like the ellipse tool up here. Um, I wouldn't want to try to create these shapes any other way using the pin tool, for example. It, should, it would be an exercise in futility, but with an elliptical shape, you know, I can just draw an eye in this case pretty quick like that. But it's even quicker when you have the same elements. These two eyes are essentially the same. Once I build one, I can just clone it, Command C, Command F. Then I can just go ahead and move it over, and I have both eyes as needed. Uh, the same with the, the body of this pill are just two elliptical shapes. One's a little larger, one's a little smaller because it's in subtle perspective. And all I have to do is create the, the straight edge on the top and bottom. Now, this is where if you're using Illustrator natively and you don't have any pl plugins, um, you're going to have to eyeball this. You're going to have to have smart guides on. So when you hover over a path, it tells you, or if you're over an anchor point, it tells you that will help you, but it still won't be perfect. So you'll have to eyeball it and you'll go like this and try to figure out where a good tangent would be. And then you would do something like this to get that edge and ultimately um, unite these together using Pathfinder down here. But I'm going to show you a better way to do this. It's not something I need to do every day, but when I do need to do it, uh, this plugin comes in handy. Uh, this plugin is um, is uh, part of Vector Scribe, so I just want to show it to you. And the plugin is called Tangent. Well, the plugin is called Vector Scribe. The tool, because you get multiple tools with this plugin, um, is called Tangent Line Tool. And here's how it works. Really simple. Click on it. Go to one shape, click, go to next shape, and it automatically finds the precise tangent. And then once you have that, just switch over to the pin tool, and then you can flow out the rest of the shape. We'll go back to it. We'll do the one at the bottom. We'll put it here. It finds the perfect tangent. Switch to the pin tool, build out the shape, close the path. So now all we have to do is select these three shapes, unite them with Pathfinder, and now we have everything needed. I'll make a clone of this shape. Now, when I say clone, I have all kinds of keyboard shortcuts set up. Maybe I'll do a video on that at some point and share that with you. But if you do things routinely, like what I'm about to do, I like to clone things. I used freehand for 15 years before I switched to Illustrator. I've now used Illustrator 20 years. Uh oh, that kind of gives away my <laughs> gives away my age, but there you go. Um, uh, it had a clone command where you just hit the command and it copies that exact shape. I set up a keyboard shortcut to do that. So I want to make a clone of this. All I have to do is hit the F3 key, which essentially is doing Command C, Command F, uh, uh, copy, paste in front, and it just makes a copy. And I also have part of my command it brings to front. So it's on top of all the other objects because in this case, I'm going to use it to trim this one minus front. By the way, you know an engineer named these uh, Pathfinder options when they name it minus front. Um, in freehand, it was called punch. 
Why? Because it's simple and makes sense. Minus front. What the hell does that mean? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what that means. So that's how I get all the basic shapes here. Obviously, there's other simple shapes, such as the circular uh, elliptic shapes in um, uh, the side of the shoes, the drop shadow we have on the ground. Those are all part of the initial shapes I create. Now, once again, the arms, the pipe. Uh, kind of pipe cleaner arms and legs that's popular in this style. These are the easiest to build. I just build simple strokes centered within the drawing that I did. And then I'll just go to strokes here, figure out the size. In this case, we're going to size these 24 points. Boom, we're done. That's easy. Now, eventually, I'll go ahead and I'll expand these. So I go here and I go expand like that. And then if I sample our stroke to turn it into an actual shape, but I'm not going to bother to do that on all the other ones. I just wanted to point that out. So, um, by the way, when I build, I tend to isolate things in my design. If I'm done with a face, I'll create a face layer, hide it, focus on something else. Then I start modeling everything together. Uh, once again, Using layers is a good creative habit to get into. Nothing's more frustrating than getting a really complex file from another creative person. <laughs> and they, they have everything on one layer. Really, really not smart. Really not, uh, you're not being nice to your creative friends when they have to work with your files when you do that. So here's the rest of the shapes for the face, his eyebrows, his mouth shapes. Anytime it's easier to build a shape without, like it's easier to build this mouth shape by building this shape first and doing this little sliver shape. I wouldn't want to try to do that all as one path. It's just, it, it, there's no reason to. I can just create two shapes and just go unite, boom, I'm done, it looks great. So uh, think smarter, not harder. Um, then the same applies to the bottom shadow on the lip. That's how I kind of handled that. Now I'm going to move to the shoe here and I'm going to zoom in so you can see this because um, I wanted all of these. If we look at the shoe over here, I don't have anything built on. All these gaps in between the laces, in between the shoe and the, the rubber sole part on the edge here and the rubber front part on the front of the of this shoe, all these gaps, I want these to be the same tolerance. The only difference to that is where it goes into the tongue here. It kind of flares a bit, that's okay. But everything else, I want these same tolerances. I created this original sole shape on um, uh, this character's foot here, and then I just offset it to create this shape. Now I'm gonna use this shape to edit this shape so I get that edge trimmed so it will look really nice. But I create the shapes like these initially because I wanna be able to go to path, offset path, and you can use, by the way, um, properties. If you, I'm, I'm recording this on an iMac so I don't have a lot of real estate on screen. So I've hidden stuff into categories down here but if you scroll down actually let's do that if we scroll down here and i have a shape selected well you probably can't even see it because it's going off screen let's bring this over here you can see there's an offset here and i accidentally moved that shape let's put that back where it should go so this is where you can also get to the same menu by clicking offset it's going to remember the last time you used the tool in this case i was doing something at 35.08 points. I should point out that I always work in points. It's metric system. And I always kind of think in whole numbers, it just makes the math easier. Um, but we're not obviously doing that. Um, so I'm not gonna worry about that. We'll turn off preview. What I wanna do here is I wanna offset this four. So I'm gonna hit four and click okay. That's gonna work. We'll select this one. Once again, if you want to use offset here, we'll do four on that one. And let me shove this back down here because I only use properties uh, when I'm on my workstation, which has two monitors, large monitors, and I don't have my workspace is just clutter free of palettes. Those are on my second monitor. But recording, you want to show all that. So it kind of gets a bit cluttered. So what I want to do now is I want to take this original offset here 
And just so you can see what I'm doing, we'll make sure this is in front and we're gonna fill this, we'll fill it with the blue. This is on top of this shape. So I'll select both these shapes and I'll just go minus front. That's gonna trim it. So now that side of the sole works really well. We'll take this one, we'll go ahead and fill this with blue, select the front part of the shoe and we're gonna trim that. Now, one thing I did that I didn't want to do is I didn't want to get rid of this shape. I should have made a copy of it. So we're going to make a copy of this, Command-C, Command-F. Once again, it's cloning it. And then I'll trim it because I want to use these to edit the inner parts here. So I don't want to get rid of these. So this is where I'll reuse shapes. So even though we got everything trimmed now, I'm going to save these two shapes. And I'm actually going to bring them to front. And with these two, I'm going to go ahead and unite them like that. Now we'll turn on the laces here. And the same principle, let's zoom in even farther here. This was the first lace. I offset it for, once again, like I did the other shapes. But I want this to, here's the second one I built. So this offset, I'm going to go ahead and clone this select the second lace and we're going to minus front to trim it because I want that gap to be there. So I just wanted to point that out. And then we're going to go to this lace, which is kind of swooping up like it's coming, coming undone as he's walking, his foot swinging forward. And we're going to take the offset of that and we're going to use that just to edit the bottom edge of the tongue shape so it gets the correct profile like that. Oh, and I did it again. I didn't want to get rid of this one. So let's go ahead and clone that. Command C, Command F. Then we can select the tongue. Then we can trim it. Normally, I'm not talking as I'm working. So uh, bear with me as I make those kind of mistakes. So all these, I'm just going to fill blue. And we'll go ahead and bring to front so you can see what's going on like that. Deselect the the initial shapes. We're going to fuse these or see, I even use fill after using illustrator for nearly 20 years. Now I still say fuse because it makes more sense to me. Fuse, fuse them together. Not uh, unites, not bad. That's, that's a little better. I'll give the engineers a little credit on that one. This one will bring to front and I'm going to take this shape and I'm also going to unite that together because it was easier to create a shape like this where I just paid attention to this edge profile, knowing that the remainder profile of the shape is gonna be made by the offset of the other shapes I already created. So in that case, I'll select that, select the base of the shoe, minus front, boom, I have everything I need for the shoe. It's easier to create shapes independently at times. So rather than trying to go point, point, here, then go up here, go around here, here. It's easier to create these independent shapes. Then I can select both, unite them. In this case, I can select one corner, round it with the corner widget. Now I use a plugin too, but on this kind of stuff, I'll just use the corner widget since it's readily available like that. And that's how I'll create the shape on here. Obviously we did offsets on those shapes as well to get the profile to match the outline uh, in the drawing that goes around the shoe as well. So that's how I handled it. Now let's go up here to this hand because um, this is how I usually approach building at times. I'll figure out what's the easiest shape to create based off of the shape I have to create. In this case, I'm going to just create the focus on the outer perimeter of the overall hand. I'm not going to worry about this inner detail uh, because I can just go ahead and build those independently. And if I turn on the inner detail, you can see it's easier to create one shape, then another shape and another. So I can just select all of these, unite them, and then just so you can see what I'm doing, let's color it blue. So now this is sitting on top of the other shape. So I'll just select both of them and I'll minus front. So I'll punch through. Now, when you build like this, there's not, nothing wrong with it. Uh, this is actually a great way to build. It's very precise, but Illustrator will default this to a group. So this isn't a compound. I always like using compound shapes. 
So I'll change this back to a group. Because Illustrator does this, that's just the way it works. Um, I never had this problem in freehand. Freehand always assumed if it starts as a compound, you want it to remain a compound. Illustrator says, nope, we think you should use a group. And a group, you can lose stuff. And I'm going to show you why. Um, so right now, this is a group. If you look at the appearance panel, let's say for whatever reason, um, you wanted a notch taken out of this finger. And so I select that and I go minus front there. Look what happens. You lose stuff if it's a group. If it's not a group, if I select this, and I have a keyboard shortcut for this, F7, which I just hit, and it changes it to a compound path, then I can do whatever I want with this shape, and nothing disappears. But notice, it's still going to revert back to a group. Very frustrating. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. So I always change it to a compound path. And then, obviously, on the outer perimeter of the hand, once again, I go back to shapes. Anytime a shape is going to be easier to build something, then I just do that rather than this was a freeform shape. So I used the pen tool to create all this. But when I got to these, I wanted these to be nice, perfect elliptical shapes along with the bottom here. And so once I do that, I can just select all of them, unite, uh, unite them all together, and these are going to work great. So it's always, for me, a combination between shape building and freeform building using the pin tool. Most people associate Illustrator with the pin tool, but if you work smart, you can do so much with shapes as well. So let's go ahead and turn all these off, including this one. And this just shows the base vector art here. And it's usually at this point that I want to kind of beta test if this is going to work. And what I mean by that is I'm going to actually color it so it appears like the final black and white artwork, uh, even though it isn't. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to select all the elements I know I want black. So the eyes, the eyebrow, like that, this arm, the outline on that, the outline on this hand, this arm and this shoe and the drop shadow itself. And we'll just go up here and we're just gonna color these black like that. Fill them with black, that is. That looks good. All of these, you know, it's easier to select at times if you zoom in. It kind of annoys me because um, I don't always wanna zoom in, but I'm finding as Illustrator progresses, they make selection at certain zoom ratios, like uh, really, really hard for some reason. So in terms of the detail on the bottom of, the, of uh, this shoe, I want this inner, well, let's go ahead and do the, the base of the shoe itself. So all these laces like this, all of this is going to be white with no stroke like that. This will be white too. These will be black. This detail will be black. All the tread will be black. This will be white. And the proverbial hole in the walking shoe, these guys do a lot of walking. This will be white, just to work out how you can distinguish which leg is behind and in front. This will be white. We'll do the laces and the rubber soles. Those will all be white. These little, do you know what the little holes in those sneakers are? They're vent holes. Like that. But notice we have this shape. You wouldn't see this part of the shoe. So this is where I'll just Command-C, Command-F, make a copy, select this, and we'll just go minus front. Once again, it's going to group, so I always hit F7, turn it into a compound. That looks good. Let's go up here. All the inner eye detail. We'll color all that. No stroke. These will all be white. This little wedge here. This will be white. No outline like that. This little edge detail. White tongue white hand create that white and that will be black 
The pill itself, we're going to color that white fill. We're going to give it a black outline. And if I go to stroke, let's see, we want to beef this up. Let's go six, maybe a little larger, 6.5. That looks good, but I want this thickness to be the same as what's showing on the hand and around the, the feet. So I'm going to select this shape, and I'm going to clone it. Command-C, Command-F. Go ahead and fill it with black, too. Copy it to the clipboard. Paste behind. It's still selected. Now we're going to adjust this, and I think let's try 20 or 15. It's close, maybe a little more. 20 should probably do it then. There you go. That looks good. So this is how I'll test it. Now, if I go to key line view here or outline view, uh, this is what it looks like. So it's not clean art, meaning it's not perfect shapes that I can select and fill yet. Uh, this is just testing if it's going to look good with all of these in their the way they're handled, we can go ahead and turn off the sketch now, um, in black and white. And I think it is, but it's at this stage I realize, you know, looking at my reference for the pill, I think it needs one more level of edge detail. So this is where I'll go back and I'll make another kind of decision to add a detail. This also when I'll use what I call a throwaway shape meaning a shape for no other reason than to edit another shape. It's not going to be part of the final art. We'll trim this like that, and then this will be colored black, and I think that looks a lot better. So now that I know my black and white artwork is going to work, what do I mean by clean art? Well, I'll show you the difference. This is kind of my mock-up to test if everything base art wise colored the way it was will be black and white is going to work i think it is and then if i turn on cleanup the only difference between these two is um i can see i somehow lost my vent down here my vent de they're the holes for the shoe so let's go ahead and bring those to the front there you go so that's one thing you can check if you're you're going to lose <laughs> you lose something like I did there. But clean meaning notice all these with vector art everything comes to a sharp dagger point. Um everything. So what I do and this is best shown if I zoom in. So let's zoom in. Notice in my mock up these come to a sharp point. Obviously. Now in my cleanup art they're still the same shape, but I go in and put subtle rounds. Notice how I put subtle rounds on pretty much everything, even on all these. Rather than letting it go to extreme point, if I go back to my uh, original mock-up, you can see how it comes to a dagger sharp point. I just think it looks a lot better if you take the time to button up your art by adding those subtle rounds into it. I think it just looks way better and you want to do that before you add all the detail because um, it'll be a pain to, to go back and try to change it after the fact. So I think this is going to work. Now my color scheme I have in mind uh, looks like this. So pretty simple color scheme. Black is obviously part of the color scheme. Uh, he's a red pill so guess what color he gets? Well of course he gets red and just so he's color coordinated I think his shoes should be red as well. And it's usually at this point, before I even color it, I'll print out a black and white. And I should show you that because this is where I'll go back to analog. And I just find it easier to think through the detailing by literally drawing on my printout. If it's super complex, I might scan it back in and build from it like I did my original sketch. But in this case, I just reference my drawing that's sitting on my desktop as I'm working and I build out those shapes. So all the shading on this character in the white areas, this is how it looks like. His tongue um, is a nice gray color with a nice white highlight like that. I think in his eyes here, this uh, secondary reflection, we want that to be this lighter gray as well. And I think this is looking good. Let's go ahead and turn on the highlights. The highlights are what really kind of bring it to life. 
in terms of the pill itself. I think those look pretty good. And here's another thing. We're going back to strokes and we're going to do all of our highlighting on the leg here. So this is just a simple stroke. It's just four points. We're going to go up and pick the uh, the width profile one, which is uh, default in Illustrator, apply it, and you can see how it just tapers the end, which I think looks really nice. We're going to color this the dark gray. I don't want it to be that overt. I want it to just give some volume and form to his legs and arms, and I think this is going to work really great. And the last thing we want to do is we want to use a little bit of halftone in this for the shading aspect. And I'm just going to show you a simple, dead simple way to create this kind of shading. Uh, this is a halftone shading, but I made the circular shapes, the dots, if you will, in this halftone purposely not exact with one another. Some are a little distorted, some are bigger, some are a little smaller, but they're close enough that it works as a unified whole. But I wanted it to look subtly imperfect. And this is how you set it up. Think of a bounding box. This is your tile. So wherever it goes off the top, these circles, it has to come in at the bottom at the same area. Where it goes off to the right will come in on the left. As long as you get those correct, anything in the middle can be any way you want. doesn't matter. You just want to set it up top, bottom, left, and right so it seamlessly repeats. Once you do that, we're going to trim it. And in this case, all you have to do is literally drag and drop it into swatches. Deselect. You can see it's a new swatch pattern. I might double click into that and change the name like halftone if I wanted to, but I'm not going to bother doing that. I just want to show you how easy it is to create that. Once you create it, we're going to turn on our vector shapes here. This represents where all the shading is going to be. And all we're going to do is we're going to go to the fill. We're going to fill it with the halftone. Look how cool that looks. So it works really simple uh, to pull off this kind of artwork using um, the methods I just showed you. Now, the final context of this design is what I think is going to work great for a sticker. It's going to work great on a t-shirt. Maybe you want your t-shirt to be a white t-shirt. I rarely wear white t-shirts anymore. So if I did this on a lighter color, it'd probably be a light gray. And then I'd print white just so you have that nice contrast happening. But I think it's really going to work well on a colored garment, in this case, a red. I don't even have to print the red. It can be the red of the shirt uh, showing through. Uh, this current trend is something anyone watching this movie can attempt. So I encourage you to figure out a good subject matter and topic. You can anthropomorphize and have fun with it. If you like this movie, please consider sharing a link to my channel on social media. I'd really appreciate that. I'm going to start sharing more and more content like this on my YouTube channel. So thank you for watching People Love Process. I hope this content helps you improve your own creative process.